it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Catherine Yevdukova, professor of history at our neighboring university, Columbia. Uh, but of course, during this plague-stricken year, uh, we don't even have to get on the subway to see each other. So welcome to the Jordan Center, Catherine. So I'm going to say a few words about uh, Catherine's life before Columbia, her professional life. Uh, she received her BA at Harvard uh, in its renowned social studies program. Now at that time, I was teaching in the rival undergraduate program, history and literature. And that's when we first met way back then. Catherine did her graduate work uh, both at, in Paris uh, at the Institut des Etudes Politiques and uh, she and at Berkeley. She taught for many years, as most of you know, at Georgetown University with visiting professorships at Bayazici University and at the Ecole des Études en Sciences Sociales at Paris. All that before joining us, or at least joining New York uh, in 2016 as a professor in Columbia's history department. So I, would, I want to say a few words about Catherine's research and publications. She cannot be labeled a cultural or an intellectual or social historian. She is all of these things. She's a scholar of very wide ranging interests uh, and original nonconformist thought. Her many books and articles uh, not only address unlike subjects, but they have introduced whole new areas of inquiry to Russian studies. Her first book, The Cross and the Sickle, and I'm fortunate to have had these uh, here. Uh, first book, Cross and the Sickle, uh, showed uh, the intersection between uh, religion and social reform in the Silver Age and into the revolutionary period, uh, exploring with a focus on the philosopher and religious activist Sergei Bulgakov. Now that book appeared in 1997, well before the flood of scholarly interest in religion. But by that time, by the time the book came out, Catherine had already begun work on projects that were de reorienting, re reorienting the study of Russia outside the capitals. And the volume called Kazan, Moscow, St. Petersburg, here it is in Russian, uh, published in Moscow, 1997. Uh, she edited this, edited this book with Mark Van Hagen and Boris Kasparov. And that was one of the very first publications in what we now call empire studies. But of course, Catherine's way of decentering Russian history was her own. It was not about colonialism it was not about nationality. Uh, it was rather about culture, environment, and society in a single province. And the result was her award-winning monograph, Portrait of a Russian Province, uh, based on Nizhny Novgorod. And this was a book that opened up the provincial as a topic and as a lens on Russian history. So Catherine's books have always been um, not exactly of their time, but ahead of their times, uh, both in their topics and uh, in the way that Catherine puts different approaches together. Religion, empire, provinces, culture, environment, and very important, economy. One of the most impressive aspects of her lively writing, and I'm going to close with this, is her interrogation and integration of economy and culture, environment and human possibility, religion and politics. So Catherine is now working on another major study. This one's called Russia in the Age of Elizabeth, and it appears cartography is part of this story. So without further ado, let's hear from Catherine about her topic, a complete map of the Russian Empire. Welcome, Catherine. 
Jane, thank you so much. You're extremely kind. I'm overwhelmed and feel very shy. And I also am extremely impressed by your bookshelf that you were able to pull these things and surely many others off it at, at uh, short notice. Um, so, all right, thank you. Um, this is my first Zoom talk ever as opposed to Zoom lecture of which I'm uh, I've given many by now, and I'm completely ecstatic and, and happy to see so many friends from near and also from very far on my screen. So um, thank you so much for coming. Um, here in New York, it's a nice rainy afternoon, which is a good time to look at some maps, which um, is what I'd like to ask you to do with me for the next uh, short time. Um, let me first tell you what this paper is. Um, it is written for a very specific purpose. Um, as many of you know, uh, Val Kivelson and Joan Neuberger did a fantastic volume called Picturing Russia quite a few years back. I was trying to remember when, maybe already 15 years ago or so. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, they, it was such a success uh, worldwide that um, they have now launched a new project, which is again about visuals, um, but this time with an imperial theme. And um, when they brought this subject up to me, I sort of on a, on a whim, I had a spontaneous inspiration that the 1745 Atlas would be a really interesting um, topic to look at. Uh, where for the inter intersection of visual and imperial. So that's what this is. It's essentially no one else has read it yet, although I have sent it to the editors. So I'm basically trying my paper out on you. It's a short paper because the word limit is extreme, but I'd also like to see where I can, I enjoyed working on it so much that I want to see how I could develop it further for my own work. And I hope that this conversation will be a part of that. So I'll appreciate any um, contributions that you have to make about that. Um, let me just say about the presentation itself, the visual aspect is important. So what the maps mostly that I'm going to show are not illustrative, they are the essence of what I want to talk about. So I'm going to try to leave them long enough on the screen so you can actually get into them. Um, I, we can all, of course, go back to them after I finish talking and, and explore, but the point is do, do pay attention to them, please. And second comment before I launch in is that this is a true pandemic paper. It was written, um, there is nothing in here that could not be accessed from the comfort of my couch. Um, I conceived and wrote it during the summer. So um, there, this is the, the, it's completely devoid of any exciting archival finds, except such as someone else might have posted on the internet. Um, so it's an interesting experiment in, um, in uh, home-based research. All right, the title is A Complete Atlas of the Russian Empire from 1745. And let me move to the pictures. That's the, the fun part. The austere title page of the 1745 Atlas of the Russian Empire, simple block letters in red and black, proclaimed an ambitious goal. Published in 19 regional maps and a general map of this, this great empire, that's in quotation marks, Velikia Sia Imperi, you can see that the, the uh, the formulations on the title page are not trivial. They're full of all kinds of meaning. Um, the Atlas would unite geographical rules and quote, new observations to create a complete picture of the all Russian empire and contiguous lands. The imprimator of the Imperial Academy of Sciences imparted sufficient weight to make fancy illustrations and inscriptions unnecessary. Nonetheless, as the pages unfurl,
we are greeted by the magnificent expanse of Eurasia from the Baltic Sea to the Pacific Ocean, now adorned with the imperial seal, images of naval ships and whaling vessels, and with the newly discovered stretch of water separating Chukotka from Alaska emphatically indicated. The regional maps that follow depict Russia's districts, Uyezdi, and include the Kazan and Astrakhan Khanates and the private domains of the Stroganov family. The hydrographic component, rivers, lakes, wetlands, is represented with particular care. The six maps of Siberia are scaled smaller to accommodate the vast distances. Even at a quick glance, this enlightenment era atlas looks strikingly different from the tentative and geographically limited 17th century sketches of Blau or Massa, or the ebullient and ambitious map of all Siberia by the remarkable Simon Rimezov. Let me show you those. These are from Valerie Kivelson's uh, cartographies of Sardom and also another of her essays. This is Blau and Massar, two Dutchmen in the 17th century. As you see, uh, anywhere to the east is simply designated as Tartary. So there's no, uh, there's no effort to penetrate very far. I'm just going to look at these very quickly just for the general idea. And this is Massa's map. This is about the middle of the 17th century. And here we have a very different creature. Unfortunately, it's not the best possible image because it's such a rich picture, but it's a plate in Val's book. This is Remezov's map of all Siberia. Um, you'll note if you look at it that there are some surprising elements. You might think that Gorbachev succeeded with the project of turning the rivers around because they're flowing in the wrong direction. Um, but he may as have had a much better way of achieving that project. He simply put south at the top and north at the bottom. So you're not actually seeing a completely distorted map. But in the 17th century, it was common um, to do direction however you want it. And so we actually have uh, Moscow over here, the big, right big red flame. And the all important place for Remezov is Tobolsk, which for him was basically the center of the universe. So there are all sorts of fun things about this, like, such as there is Moria Akian up here and um, various places. So these very beautiful, artistically lovely um, uh, rivers and so on. But as you see, um, they're quite different from the, from the map we're looking at here. So the atlas of the all Russian empire visually encapsulates the enlightenment urge to scientific measurement and representation. The maps look different because their dominant concern is to arrange their materials around points whose exact location has been astronomically and geographically determined and to bring the images on the flat paper maps into as close a relation as possible to the spheroid shape of the earth. At the same time, the cartographers preserved some of their Muscovite predecessors fondness for pictorial detail as evidenced, for example, by the trees, extravagant cityscapes and fire breathing mountains all in miniature that also grace the Atlas pages. We'll look at some of those later. But first, uh, the first, first I would like to introduce the team. The cartographic team could not have been more illustrious. Its formation coincides exactly with the early history of the Imperial Academy of Sciences, officially founded at St. Petersburg on the eve of Peter I's death in 1725. Invited by Peter in 1721, the talented French astronomer Joseph Nicolas de Lille his dates are 1688 to 1768. He's the guy on the left at the top. Finally arrived in March, 1726, charged with establishing an observatory in St. Petersburg and with crafting a general map of the Russian empire using a method which came to be named after him of matching astronomical observations with measurements from travelers. Already in 1727, De Lille was joined by his older brother, 
Louis de Lille de la Croyère, 1685 to 1741, he's three years older, this guy number two, um, on a three-year expedition to the Kola Peninsula with the Atlas as the eventual goal. The brilliant Swiss mathematician, Leonhard Euler, 1707 to 83, we have him here down at the bottom, this portrait of Euler, uh, received a coveted appointment to the Academy in 1726, followed by the creation of the geographical department with Euler at its head in 1735. The Atlas would not have been the same without venerable Senate clerk, Ivan Kirillovich Kirillov up here, 1689 to 1737, who while not as sophisticated in mathematics or astronomy brought practical expertise in navigation and surveying. His insistence on older map making techniques with rivers and roads as the foundation proved productive for charting little known territories. Never a member of the Academy, Kirillov was appointed head of the Orenburg expedition by Empress Anna in 1734. He simultaneously launched a fantastically ambitious project of his own, a complete atlas of the empire in three volumes of 120 maps each. Just 37 of these maps were actually published before his death in 1737. St. Petersburg-based um, astronomy professor uh, von Winsheim and the Leipzig astronomer Henzius came on board towards the end. No less integral to the crafting of the atlas were the dozens of trained geodesists, draftsmen, surveyors, engravers, and others who contributed data to the project, recorded its results, or staffed the expeditions. Among them were the anonymous geodesists dispatched to per province throughout the empire in the late 1720s. 30 such specialists were trained in the early days of the academy. While such initial efforts produced at best spotty results, the famous Kamchatka expeditions led by the Danish explorer Vitus Bering, 1681 to 1741, were far more productive and mobilized an enormous resource network of up to 600 men at a given moment. De Lille de la Croyère, this one, whose key astronomical observations during the second Kamchatka expedition, by the way, which lasted from 1733 to 43, enabled the mapping of Siberia. Uh, he traveled together with naturalist Johann Georg Gmelin, the last guy on my picture, 1709 to 55, and ethnographer and historian Gerhard Friedrich Müller as well as a team that included six students, an interpreter, five surveyors, and one instrument maker, all Russian, along with a painter and draftsman, both German. That's from Gmelin's account. And just for a bit of perspective, I made a note of um, how much stuff they had with them. La Croyere had nine wagons filled with equipment, including two clocks, 27 barometers, and telescopes of five, seven, 13, and 15 feet. The academicians also carried a library of several hundred books covering the sciences and history, special interests, Latin classics, and light reading. So this is the team. Scientific and mathematical principles stood at the Atlas core. Two scientific conversations were particularly vital to the making of the Atlas. And basically those two conversations are what I'd like to explore here. The first was the theoretically simple, but practically extremely difficult exact determination of a sufficient number of latitudes and longitudes on a vast and literally uncharted territory. Finding one's way on planet earth has always been a function of the heavens. The North Star, or in the Southern Hemisphere, the Southern Cross, operated as a stable point of reference for mariners and travelers of all kinds. A simple triangulation using a basic cross staff or even just a piece of wood and a cord sufficed to determine latitude. The hitch is with longitude, uh, which was much more complicated. The comparison of local with standard time required either a very accurate and physically transportable chronometer or a variety of calculations in reference to celestial events or magnetic variation. 
Italian Renaissance cartographers taking the Mediterranean region as their point of departure and drawing upon the maps of ancient Greeks and Egyptians anchored their map making in this most fundamental element of physical location along imaginary lines horizontally and vertically encircling the globe. By the early 18th century in Russia, despite the 16th and 17th century exploration and conquest of Siberia, virtually no specific latitudes and longitudes had been measured. The first thing Deville did upon the completion of the observatory was to determine exactly the latitude and longitude of St. Petersburg. For practical reasons then, this red, I've put little red dots here. Um, for practical reasons, St. Petersburg, whose precise location was now reliably fixed, became ground zero or the reference point for mapping the empire. The precise co coordinates of Arkhangelsk came next. Again, my red dots. Uh, this was the main result of the Delisle brothers' Kola expedition. By the time the second Kamchatka expedition concluded in 1743, the cartographers had complete data based on new astronomical observations for exactly eight points and only eight points. In addition to St. Petersburg and Arkhangelsk, they had established the precise longitudes for Kazan, then skipping all the way to Irkutsk. Um, two Siberian log forts or uh, Astrog at Kirinsk and Alekminsk, Yakutsk, and the Petropavlovsk Harbor near the southern tip of the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is the last red dot I can't show you because your pictures are hiding it for me. Um, Latitudes, as mentioned, were easier. The atlas boasted a table of 62 locations, towns, forts, or monasteries whose latitudes were based on new measurements. The rest was a matter of geometry, and Euler did a lot of this. The map of Smolensk province and the surrounding region was based on the triangle of Kiev, St. Petersburg, and Moscow, Little Tataria on Kiev, Achakov, and Azov, uh, the Siberian map I'm showing you here with those three those three points, um, Irkutsk, Kirinsk, and Olikminsk, um, uh, on several overlapping triangles connecting Arkhangelsk, Kazan, Solikamsk, and Tobolsk. So there's a lot of math involved here. The simplicity of the task and the spare elegance of its representation on the map belies the physical obstacles that needed to be overcome to accomplish it. De La Croyer's traveling partner, Gmelian, gives us a tactile sense of the daily adventures the scientists experienced in their decade long voyage. And this is how I entertained myself during this long summer was plowing my way, uh, going on a virtual trip of Siberia led by Gmelian, who's an amazing guide. Um, the original 1754 edition is all available online. Um, it took the group several months to make it from St. Petersburg to Tver only, where they began their, ri their river trip to Kazan. They managed to lose contact with the boat, carrying their group and supplies, tracking it down only as they approached Kazan itself. Winter brought temperatures of minus 40 degrees and lower, winds that froze their tea before they had time to swallow it, quarters in dark and windowless shacks. Summers were hot and the mosquitoes and bugs, mashka, made it impossible to write even fully hooded and wearing gloves. The cockroaches, which Gmelian can't help calling Tarakanen in acknowledgement of their fierceness, were ubiquitous. The travelers wended their way through nearly impenetrable forests and forded fast flowing rivers. Local guides could get lost and were sometimes unaware of recent changes in the landscape. Horses needed to be fed and were sometimes so exhausted that they set the pace of the journey. Illness happened and on one occasion Gmelian was forced to retrace his steps in loyalty to the dangerously ill Müller, losing a full 10 days. The house he rented in Tomsk during the winter of 1741 burned to the ground, although he was able to salvage a small barrel of Rhine wine, which smelled only slightly of smoke. As for de la Croyere, the Frenchman grew impatient with his colleagues' fascination with local industry and ethnography and left the group to press on to Tobolsk to take his astronomical measurements. The struggle with nature and the conquest of sheer technical difficulties were the hallmark of mapping the empire's eastern expanses. 
Now my next scientific problem, uh, once meridians and parallels had been determined, how would they be drawn on the actual maps? The second major scientific conversation embodied in the atlas regards the specific shape of the earth, a matter, matter of instant, intense discussion at this time. While the earth's generally spherical nature was accepted, was it really more oval than strictly round and were the poles somewhat flattened? The strategy in the case of the atlas was highly conscious and involved a philosophical understanding of the relation of parts to the whole. If we look at the three maps reproduced here, we see that they do not represent space in the same way. For the general map of the empire, Delisle adopted a modified, I won't show it to you again, or I could, I guess I'll just go back, adopted a modified um, conic projection defining two standard parallels along which scale was preserved. The empire's spread across Eurasia was therefore a reasonable approximation of its shape on a globe or in our day on Google Earth. In contrast, the maps of the European or more accurately, accurately non-Siberian parts of the empire are drafted using close to a simple grid where the meridians and parallels are presumed to be at right angles. It's not exactly the case, but very close to that. This was a considered decision. In regional maps where the area covered is not so great, the virtues of a grid are that it preserves distances and is therefore more useful for travel. And the distortions for relatively well-known regions are not significant. Finally, the six Siberian maps like this one were distinguished not only by the difference in scale as has often been noted, but by their use once more of a conic projection. It is a remarkable illustration of the need to turn to global mapping techniques for truly large spaces, and even more important of the capacity to represent the Eurasian space in a way that could be integrated into a global map. It seems fair to say that the cartographers were particularly obsessed with Siberia, where accurate new observations were simply necessary in order to draft any semblance of a map that could have meaning beyond the purely local. And an interesting clue in this regard uh, is provided by the Map Monde drafted by Delisle Père, Guillaume, the brother's father. I should be Claude, I think, I'm sorry. But in any case, the father at Paris in 1700. It's practically the opposite of Remezov's very local map that uh, doesn't care how it's integrated into the world at large. Um, so this is the, the father of the two Delisle brothers who, uh, who went on the expedition. It aims to be a map of the world at large, but as you can see, Eastern Siberia, as well as Middle and Western North America is honestly and touchingly represented as a complete blank space. So the Siberian expedition was the family's contribution to a complete map of the world. You can see the entire ex expedition as motivated by a desire to fill in this uh, gaping hole right here on the father's map. The simplicity of the mathematically clear lines of the final product conceals another major task. The Atlas team incorporated not only new scientific data, they also made a thorough study of pre-existing regional maps. The sources were extremely diverse and included Chinese, Mongolian, and Jesuit maps, charts of the Don, Volga, and Siberian rivers, new detailed maps of Livland and Courland, maps of the Russian, Swedish, and Russian, Russian Ottoman borders, and so on. All of these materials originally drafted using a variety of techniques and with diverging ends in mind were reconfigured to fit the mathematically calculated lines and curves of the meridians and parallels. Um, and then to move a little bit beyond scientific principles, I'd like to look at the pictorial aspects of the map. Uh, because scientific principles are not all that was re reflected in these Enlightenment era maps. The map makers seem loath to abandon the pictorial richness of the Muscovite maps, which Val Kivelson has so beautifully documented. They retain extremely reduced uh, 
pictorial representations of important features such as forests, villages, and monasteries with a new added attention to industrial sites. Maybe I should show you the legend first instead of in this order. Yes. If we could look, just have a look at that for a minute. Um, with a new added attention to industrial sites, most notably factories and key resources like ores or salt, the Atlas inherited from the Muscovite tradition an obsession with key, a key geographical feature, rivers. I'll come back to this so you don't have to study it all in detail yet, but I come back to this, um, rivers. Rivers occupy a special place in the cartographer's vision. This was in large part Kirillov's contribution. So you remember Rimezov's map, rivers are, um, are, are the main um, feature. While well, he agreed with the ultimate goal of thorough astronomical observations, Kirillov believed that in the meantime, and pending the training of enough qualified geodesists, it was rivers and roads that could provide the most reliable means of determining location. Rivers could be followed like natural roads or pathways. Kirillov specifically advocated the careful tracing of the Volga, Aka, Kama, Dvina, Dnep, and Don, as well as the great Siberian rivers. The atlas contains a separate map here of the Volga from Yaroslav to Tsaritsyn, with a whimsical inset depicting the river's pescatorial riches in the shape of a large sturgeon. The practical element, poza, is very present here as well with bridges, crossings, portages, shallows, visible rocks and hidden rocks, all indicated in the legend. Rivers doubled as resources and as means of transportation and were represented as such. The Atlas also carefully depicted mountains, fire throwing mountains, uh, uh, it's, I believe, um, yeah, Agon Vibrasolusia Gara. That's what we see here. Agon Vibrasolusia. It's a uh, 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 Bachinska Sopka. This is the Kamchatka Peninsula. Agon Vibrasolusia Gara here. Um, the steppe and forests. On the map of the Urals region, you might need a moment to look carefully. For example, you can see little trees, each of which casts a small shadow. The lush forests of Muscovite maps reduced to a minimum representation. Still, the map makers felt it necessary to retain this pictorial element, a distant echo of the ships and monsters of Renaissance maps, so minimized as to serve as mere reminders of such splendors. The Atlas paid special attention to natural resources and to factories in keeping with the practical and commercial orientation at the time. Thus we see salt mines and salt lakes. This is the moment when Lake Elton took precedence over the older enterprises of the Stroganovs, as well as the iron forges and foundries of the Urals region, just on the verge of the explosion of iron production that catapulted the Russian empire into its position as the primary iron exporter in Europe. And I focused here on the region. This is the, the these are the domains of the Stroganovs. And um, at least uh, I saw Yulia Laius here. Uh, she and I were part of a group that traveled in this region a couple of summers ago. We saw the beautiful Kungur. Uh, we were on an industrial tour and um, you can see here represented, for example, Shaitansky Zavod. Um, there's lots of factories and salt works and all these kind of Chusavaya is the main river that then flows through Yekaterinburg, which is a commercial artery. That's how the, the, um, the, the salt and the iron and everything was, was shipped eventually uh, back to St. Petersburg uh, through a complicated network of rivers. The representation of places of human habitation deserves special attention and prompts the reflection that it must be very difficult to get used to having one's environment reduced to a black dot on a map. The Atlas uses no fewer than 20 different icons for inhabited places. And these are all here on this side. 
including capital cities, fortresses, castles, merchant cities, provincial towns, stone and wood towns, bishoprics, monasteries, villages, settlements, and even ruins. Um, and here you see uh, factories, uh, uh, special iron and copper factories, sulfur factories, etc. You can see what they felt was important. We can be sure, for example, that Tobolsk remains an important place because even on the full imperial map, it boasts multiple buildings topped by a cross. On the regional map, which I'm showing you here, a flag completes the picture. This one. Perhaps most intriguing is the special designation for Mohammedan villages. a circle topped by a crescent. While Gmin in, in his travel notes describes the mosques and religious rituals of the Tatars of Kazan and Tomsk in abundant detail, I searched diligently but completely in vain for such villages on the regional map. Uh, Gmelin describes its enormous ethnographic detail. They went to the um, services, they, he observes their way of life, I looked all through Kazan Tomsk where this description uh, uh, is located. There's not a single Makhmetanska Zirevnya in the region around Kazan. I, I was really completely stupefied by this. Um, so I had to look elsewhere um, on the map. My hunt proved more successful way further south across the southern steppe border outside the empire in little Tataria um, or Crimea. The peninsula is studded with the little crescents and very impressive Muslim centers in places like Bakhcha Sarai, Karasul Bazar, and Akhmeshit, the future, future Simferopol. And I, that's hard to see, so I made it a close up. You can definitely see the little crescents all over the place. Um, so, my question is how, can we, how should we read this? And I hope you'll have some ideas, which would be welcome. Um, my, First suggestion is Muslim settlements did not belong within the boundaries of Orthodox Rus, so that if they existed, one would simply ignore them. Once one is on the territory of the other, it is fine to show them on the map. Something interesting is that the map's careful conformity with contemporary scientific principles fails entirely outside the imperial borders. Presumably the geodesists did not have the opportunity to travel to the Tatar Khan's domains to establish landmarks in the Crimean Peninsula. Instead, we have a misshapen agglomeration with only vaguely correct contours with even Bakhcha Sarai only very approximately situated. Um, all right, I'm gonna wind up this, uh, this part here. Um, the atlas of the All-Russian Empire was 20 years in the making, not such a long time for an excruciatingly difficult project. The atlas proved trying to physical health. Euler was forced to leave the project prior to its completion, citing failing eyesight. You could probably see in his portrait, one of his eyes is, uh, not, doesn't look so good. Geography, he noted, is fatal to me for this work in which one must always survey a large space at once assaults the vision far more strongly than simple reading or writing. He soon left Russia too for the perceived stability of Frederick II's Prussia, returning only after the end of the second years, Seven Years' War in 1766. His last years were very productive and included some of his key ideas on cartographic theory, although he was almost completely blind. Of the other lead participants in the atlas, Kirillov died in 1737 and de la Croyere died upon returning from Kamchatka in 1741. Prolonged absence could be dangerous when Joseph Nicolas de Lille went off to Abdorsk at the estuary of the Ob River in the Siberian far north in March of 1740 to observe the transit of Mercury, he found himself replaced on his return at year's end. Still, the final atlas was submitted in his name. 
the complete, in quotation marks, atlas embodies the enlightenment vision of empire. The maps unite the simple scientific principle of precise measurement of latitude and longitude with an extremely trying and difficult immersion in the frozen and impenetrably forested landscapes of Siberia. The cartographers made full use of the scientific laboratory that was the expanse of Russia. Science and precision extended to the drafting process as well. The cartographers were acutely aware of the difficulties of bringing regional maps together into a whole and preserving physical contours while not losing accurate distances. The project fused the pinnacle of European science with the natural expanses of Eurasia. The maps further represent a synthesis of scientific principles with the representational tendencies of earlier Muscovite maps. The final product made the Russian Empire available to global cartographers, inscribing this difficult region into the Enlightenment map of the world. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my uh, formal presentation. So, um, Jane, would you like to take over? Uh, yes. Uh, so now um, we have um, uh, plenty of time for questions, and indeed, Catherine can speak more about other aspects of the project. Um, I don't see any questions coming over uh, the chat at this moment, but well, are there two you... people have sent me private messages. Um, Yanni would like to speak. Uh, well, okay, well, Yanni, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Um, Jane and, and Sasha, should I keep this up? Do you think, do, should I keep this up or, or close it for now? You can close it for now. Okay. So Yanni, go oh. ahead. All right. All right. Am I unmuted? You're yes. unmuted. Yeah. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Catherine, thank you. This is, is this the early stages of the project? I didn't, I didn't catch that part. Uh, this is, this is just a little essay for um, Val and Joan's uh, book on visual hmm. aspects of empire. Um, what I'm hoping is that I might um, expand it into a chapter of of my book, yes. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. And it's, uh, it has this sort of, um, you know, uh, inquiring deme uh, demeanor right now. I mean, the way you present it and the way you raise questions. And uh, that's actually sometimes even more useful because it, uh, it, it allows us to imagine and to see where the things might go. Uh, of course, the first thing I thought of, and I, which you didn't mention, would be a sort of, you know, um, you know, look at the big empty spaces, right? You know, look how Europe, the European parts are in great in some detail, they, they're subject to a grid, whereas as we get more to the east, then it becomes more uh, empty space. I can't look at a map anymore and not think of Joseph Conrad, right? Um, you know, the, how, how things are empty, right? And, and unexplored. And that, I don't think you necessarily have to follow that because it's also kind of obvious, uh, but I wonder if you had thoughts about that. Uh, the next thing I had in mind was, um, well, it's a, it's a series of questions or comments or observations related to um, how people are or are not represented in this. Now, this is the 18th century, right? You wouldn't expect to see uh, a map which would give you representations of, um, of, of populations, right? And this is, you know, this wouldn't be consistent with that period of time, you know, mid 18th century. And, um, and for that, you'd have to go to the 19th and maybe even the 20th century. If you want to look at a map, in other words, which seems to equate uh, territory with people, uh, and here we don't see that except it's hinted at in, in some regards. And so it's hinted at in the first instance in the sense that the map is drawn, as you said, according to travel routes. Uh, it's implying, in other words, how people are moving. Uh, there's, even though it's, you know, it's a nice and it's, a, it's an, like an, an antique map, it's nevertheless implying motion right, and, and mobility, um, meaning those parts which matter are the ones where people would be moving through the rivers and through the roads. You might say, well, that's obvious because you know those are the parts that we know about and those are the parts that are more populated and whatnot. Uh, on the other hand, it's also implying a certain dynamism, uh, which I find interesting and also consistent to some extent with what you're talking about in enlightenment thinking. Um, but then even when we have the representation of those villages, of uh, villages, I guess, now are they saying that these are predominantly Muslim villages or are they villages with mosques? Uh, are they, either way, they're hinting at people, uh, but, but they're not going into much detail. Uh, you could say that a church doesn't talk about people. It talks about what mosque is there and what church is there, but that's still not talking about the character of the population. Um, 
uh, or or do you think that's what's happening? That they're really saying that this is a population of Muslims. That's it. Okay, great. Should I respond so, right away, Jane? Or, uh, go ahead. Sure. Um, yes, thank you, Yanni. Um, uh, yes, good questions. Um, on the first one, empty spaces. Yes, certainly. Well, I'm. I think what I'm trying to convey, you saw the empty space on the, the De Lille pairs map, right? Really literally empty space. Um, I think the, uh, the, the point of the, the empty spaces is that, I mean, my, my notion of the enlightenment project based on this kind of staring at this particular map for, for quite a long time and looking at all the details is that it's a question of having the basic principles and then how incredibly difficult it is to fill in uh, the missing parts. So actually drafting, simply making a map is extraordinarily difficult, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, we think of, uh, the, the form that you asked the question in implies that we can draw whatever kind of map we want. What I'm trying to convey here is how unbelievably difficult it was to put anything for the region of Siberia. Um, simply fixing latitudes and longitudes was unspeakably difficult, difficult. Something else I realized is that in the Renaissance, of course, they could draw on antique maps where much of this had been done. This was a literal blank space. And so, um, you know, my point was, was um, in fact, that filling in this blank space um, required ex overcoming extraordinary physical difficulties, but the result is that you somehow situate Siberia and Russia on a map of the world. You see, Remezov was drawing Siberia, but he, you could not coordinate, it was of absolutely no use to a geographer sitting in Paris. Mm -hmm. because it had no correlation to any other part of the globe. Am I making sense, Yanni? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you're, you're saying that, you're saying basically that it's complicated, right? So fine, yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, that the blank spaces are, are uh, you know, to be appreciated in, in themselves. Anyways, not to go on too long, but that's my sort of sketch of response to the first point. On people, yes, that's a really interesting point. We have, I see that Nathaniel, Knight is here, um, and it would be great if he could join in on this particular conversation, um, because of course the Kamchatka expedition brought back piles of ethnographic material. Right here, I was trying to focus just on the map, but Gmelin and Müller were interested in that. Um, and um, you can coordinate the ethnographic knowledge with this. It's a similar project. I don't know, do you know the book before Boas by Hans Vermeulen, he does a very similar thing. It's uh, to what I'm trying to do here is um, see Russia as a sort of laboratory and you can, he studied it for people. The cartographers were not that interested. They were more interested in um, correlating with cartographic, uh, cartographic practice elsewhere, I would mm -hmm. say. But I mean, I, as you could see, I intended to show that I'm puzzled by the treatment still of these Mohammedan villages because clearly they see, they saw that they, the people existed, the villages existed, and so did the mosques, but they did not want to portray them inside the boundaries of the empire. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I have already uh, three people who uh, want to ask questions, and then I have another one, a list on the, uh, on the chat to the public. So. Let's uh, proceed. And uh, first person uh, on my list is Russell Valentino. He wants to ask a question. Russell, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I, I think I just managed it. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is great. I, I have two very closely related questions and they follow up on that empty spaces uh, notion. Um, sometimes the, the maps from just before this period uh, have not empty spaces, but additional things that they thought might be there, but then turn out not to be there. And so my question is about, in particular, when they got rid of uh, the Gama land. Uh, and I think that the, the expedition that you mentioned, that the sea por portion of the expedition, the second Kamchatka expedition, they spent a little bit of time looking for it, because I think it was on one of their maps that Delilah or one of the French people had 
with them and he wanted to prove that it didn't exist. And so they, they floated around in the water there off the coast of off the coast of Kamchatka looking for it and wasting some of their valuable time. Um, I, maybe you know that story and can elaborate a little bit. And, and so the question is about that, when did that disappear? Uh, when did they say, okay, there's nothing there, it's water. Um, <laughs> and then the other is, is really similar. I've been struck many times by how long map makers continued to put, this is the land of the great Khan in the spaces in between the Urals and the Pacific Ocean. It, they lasted for a long time into, in some maps and even in the 17th and I thought 18th century, they were using that as a kind of a placeholder, but there's, there's almost a political aspect to it as well when you think about making a claim that it's empty versus making a claim that somebody very powerful is there. Um, and if there's somebody very powerful there and you're the Russian empire, you might prevent somebody else from coming by <laughs> propagating these maps that, that are actually false. Um, in other words, the Brits or another colonial power that might want to move in there might look at it and say, oh, the great Khan is there, um, if you see what I mean. So a kind of polit politics of when you make a claim about the territory being Russian, like the little flag on the, on the Tobolsk uh, um, uh, symbol on the map, and when, the, when they stop doing that about the great Khan, uh, when, when do those things, so, so when do these things fall off the maps is basically my question. Um, yeah, well, as you know, they're not, they're not here now, right? I mean, it's so, so, um, yeah, I mean, you're, uh, this, so you, you, between the 17th century and the 18th, not in the 18th, so far as I can tell, but I don't think I have good answers to either of your questions. I mean, the first one, um, certainly the point of the expedition was to de determine that there was water, but I don't know the specifics. I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer the specifics. I, I can tell you about the 18th century maps. They certainly aren't showing any Khans except for Crimea where, where the Khan is very much there. Mm. Okay, Christine Bruin, uh, you're next. Can we un unmute you? Got it. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Catherine. Um, I was intended, I intended to participate in this volume, but unfortunately I couldn't because of um, family problems. Um, but I looked at botanical illustration in terms of what it represents about uh, empire. And um, interestingly enough, Mr. Gmielin was very much a part of the collection of plants. I'm sure this isn't a surprise to you. And so it, what is interesting is they could have filled in the empty spaces with a few more, not just trees, but some of the more exotic things that they were finding. But my, the question I would like to ask, and this is as a result of what I was looking at. So the literature on botanical colon, colonialism and botanical illustration is that this was a way in which empires imposed a way of seeing the world by looking at plants and uh, sort of consolidating it and standardizing plants. And I think you can see this very much in 18th century Russia. But what, what I noted is, is that at this point, the people who are doing this standardization and even with the maps are primi primarily foreign scientists. And so it's a way in which they're claiming Russia, which wants to be seen as this empire as part of a larger worldwide empire of science. And so it, it in and of itself could be seen as a colonial project. So I don't know, this is my own idea. I don't know how you would respond to that, but thank you. Um, thank you, Christine. That's a good question. Yes, of course, Gmelian is full of uh, plants, his, his account. Um, so that was his mission. Um, I mean, part of the, part of the, mission of this um, piece, if I'm able to develop it, is, I mean, my feeling about empire, which is what I was trying to say at the end, the question is, of course, I mean, is this, is looking at this map helpful to determine 
um, the vision of empire. And what I came to think as time went along, I mean, we think we tend to think of the 18th century very much in terms of foreigners vers versus Russians. That's how it was seen in the 19th century by Russian historians. That's how the Soviets saw it. There is this juxtaposition. There's this idea that the Academy of Sciences is, um, is a constant conflict between, you know, Lomonosov on one hand and the, the foreign scientists on the other. Um, I find myself inclined to move away from that vision. I found that it's not necessary to make the distinction. To me, this is why I had Kirillov in there with the others. True, he did go off and do a project of his own. But to me, it seems like to them, not the most important aspect was whether you were from Russia or from France or from Germany or Holland or wherever, but that there was a common scientific project. So to me, the, the idea of empire in this map is born of an international collaboration. And to me, they don't care that much, um, at, at, at no, not nearly as much as later historians about who was what nationality, that they're just not obsessed by that. Um, and to them, what's so to me, it's almost paradoxical that this first complete, quote unquote, again, um, image of the world is born of a global project. I mean, it's it's what's important to these people is that it be legible outside, not only on a local level, as many of the Muscovite maps are. They're good, they're sophisticated, but they mean nothing outside of Russia. So um, to me, it's a little bit ironic that the empire is born not so much of nationalism as of trying to comprehend space um, in a, an international or um, universally understandable way. Of course, universalism is part of the enlightenment. I mean, what strikes me about this period and other aspects that I work on as well, it's completely devoid of this romantic us and them thing that we're so used to in Russian history. And this is what really intrigues me about the middle of the 18th century. It's just missing. So, you know, Christine, I, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to insist on this yet because I need to go into it in greater detail. But um, to me, the story of this atlas is that the idea of empire is born not of nationalism, but of um, trying to understand um, one's place in the world. And it's an international project. So this is my working hypothesis right now. Well, I think this might be a segue into Jeff Brooks's question. Jeff, uh, can you ask a question? I'll unmute you, I hope. There. I'm un unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, I think a lot of the historian of books, I th immediately began to think about this as, as some kind of book, in effect. And as a book, I, I wanted to think about it as a cultural product and there's a lot of work involving printing something like this. I assume it was printed in Russia, although you didn't say. <clears throat> it took a whole uh, army of uh, Kustar artists mm -hmm. to produce some. The only equivalent would be a coronation volume, mm -hmm. which was also inexpensive. I haven't seen 18th century, but I think of the 19th, early 19th century, <clears throat> which was a um, a lithograph that involved an enormous number of printing of the pages because of the colors. So, so my question is, without trying immediately to decide the intentionality of the project, how many copies were printed? What happened to them? And uh, who, how many people were involved? After all, there were no independent artists in Russia at this time. All those little sketches had to be produced by people who work for the state. Some of them were serfs, others at us who were making the more notable um, illustrations had been emancipated presumably in the process of becoming state artists. So there's a lot going on in the production of culture to produce something like this. And it seems to me 
and before one speculates too much on what kind of uh, picture uh, someone produced, it's worth thinking about how the whole operation worked. This isn't, you know, like some Soviet book that was all put together in Russia and then printed in Italy. This, this must, this is, you know, late Soviet. This is a different kind of operation. So that is that is my um, question. The foreign scientists were were the least of the operation in a certain sense mm -hmm. because they certainly weren't going to oversee it at this level. Someone else was going to say, give me a little more green and flashiness in this part of it. Uh, how about getting these people to come in? And So-and-so is really good at drawing fish. What about, I mean, it seems to me there's a level of production that that involves. And that's my question. I think it would be fascinating how much, I don't know how much you can know. That's it. Thank you, Jeff. That's a fantastic question. I, um, I have only very partial knowledge of it at this point, but it would be a, uh, would be an, a great thing to investigate. It was printed, uh, I mean, there was no mass printing, of course, as you know, as, and as you're pointing out, they all had to be drawn, but uh, apparently it was uh, well, it's a it's a folio. I mean, it's a it's an oversized book basically, um, and it's the the big map and nineteen regional maps. My understanding is not all of them were in color I, because I've seen examples of some where there it's basically black and white. So there were different variants. They seem to have been produced in batches. People did want to read them. They they produced them in batches of 25 to 50, and um, they were they were desired. I don't have no idea how they might have been sold. Um, it's hard to find out those things, as you know, and as Lisa knows. I'm looking at her here on my screen for the 19th century as well. Um, so um, all I can say is that that's absolutely right and also that I do know that quite a few copies were made. I mean eventually um, end of the 50s Lomonosov takes over the geography department and, and starts making more maps and substituting this one for or substituting a, a you know greater detail and so on but um, but it remained quite popular and um, and lots of people wanted it. Um, that's only the, the fragment of an answer. Well, now I have a question uh, to everyone on the chat. Uh, Nadezhda Mamontova, I don't, are you here and can I unmute you or shall I pose your question? Well, I'll pose the question. Uh, and, and again, uh, it comes off uh, Jeff, Jeffrey's comment. That is, uh, Nadezhda writes, I wonder if and how indigenous people participated in this cartographic project. Is there any mention of them in the sources? Um, there's piles of mentions of them in Gmelian and also in the, you know, Richkov, all of the materials on the Bashkirs in this region. Um, not specifically in the materials I've seen about the maps themselves. I mean, there, certainly there's there's a lot of indigenous participation in various things, but I have not seen in relation to the maps. And um, please be kind and gentle and remember that I really did do this literally on my couch. So I, I have not, you know, the things that are really hard to find, I, I will have to find later. So I'm just writing down all the questions and we'll, we'll investigate them um, because I really had to have, right now I've been working with what the basically 19th century has given me to work with. But that's also a, a good, I mean, again, I see them, I'm just thinking about other aspects. They're all over the place and other aspects, but I have not seen specifically with respect to the maps, but I have not set foot in an archive with relation to this particular line of inquiry. So thank you. It's a, it's a very helpful question. Okay, and, and next we have also from the chat, uh, Stephen Wilson. Uh, Stephen, do you want to pose the question? I can't see you, so I, I'll simply um, uh, re read the question. 
By the way, <laughs> forgive me, Jane uh, or Sasha. These this chat will be saved, right? Yeah, I can send you. I would like uh, to have a question. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll go back to Yulia Lages in a second, but Stephen Wilson first. Um, since the original maps were created via system, systematic lat latitude longitudinal measurements, is there available somewhere these, this original data? Uh, I ask because it would be a fascinating project to see if it could be directly coordinated with current GPS tools. Uh, yes. Um... The ones that were actually measured, they're right in the atlas. I mean, they're completely, mm -hmm. they're printed there. And they did, in the 19th century, they coordinated them with their measurements and they were practically identical. So they were very close. Um, and one could, absolutely, one could take GIS and check them. <laughs> okay. I mean, the same, what's fascinating, it's the same principle. I mean, GIS does the same thing that these guys were doing. They just use artificial satellites instead of the North Star or whatever other calculations. Um, but yes, they're completely available. They're right. I have that I have on my screen. And when we have another question from Yulia Vegas, um, is it right that resources are mostly depicted on these maps through human activities as, as places of production, not just deposits? Are, are forests the only exception to that? Mm -hmm. notion that the resources are depicted through human activity. Uh -huh. uh, per, you mean, so Zavodi, factories rather than deposits. They're, according to the ledge, I haven't specifically looked for the ores, but they, they do in theory, they have salt deposits and mineral deposits, not only factories. Um, more visible are the factories, but in theory, they're supposed to be there. Mm. So not only human activity. This uh, connects to your interest in environmental uh, history. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, Nathaniel Knight, um, I'm sure you do want to jump in with a question and a comment. So Nathaniel, uh, it's sure. for you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and this, this is a wonderful project. I was just so glad to see that you had, you had taken it on. Um, and obviously to intersecting with a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm working on now too. So I look forward to talking about it. Um, just a, a small note about the, the actual uh, printing of the, of the volume. Um, my understanding is that the Academy of Science had an in-house um, engraving department. And I believe that Jakob Stelen was the director of it. And so, and I'm very interested in, in the role he may have played in this. So if you know anything about that, that's, that's interesting. Um, about the depiction of peoples, um, in Yanni's question, uh, yeah, absolutely. The the expedition was involved in um, you know extensive ethnographic research, um, including uh, visual depictions of the peoples. Although most of these drawings have disappeared, but Edward Kasnick and I uh, have located what we believe is uh, remnants of them in the uh, National Museum and in Stockholm. And of course, this was Mueller's big thing. And he did an extraordinary amount of work cataloging the peoples of Siberia. And he actually wrote two books, uh, which he brought back with him to Siberia. There was a book that was individual descriptions of several uh, of, you know, individual peoples. And then there was a kind of um, analytical work uh, was his Beschreiben uh, of all the peoples of Siberia that, um, you know, that, that analyze them thematically. Um, so really a great deal of time and attention to this. The interesting thing was that he couldn't get it published when he got back to, uh, back to Petersburg in the uh, uh, 1740s. And I'm wondering if you have any sense of why that may have been. I mean, clearly there was a lot of em emphasis being put on the physical aspects of the expedition, the, the map making, the car cartography, but, um, seemed to have been very little interest at all in his ethnographic work. And it was actually published for the first time, I believe in 2006 and 2010. <laughs> so that's, uh, so, it's, it, it, so the, I think they're, I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic with your idea of sort of moving away from this notion of the, of, you know, the Germans versus the Russians. But I think there were some very difficult politics in the Academy of Sciences in right. that period. And that Mueller was on the, um, sort of got the short end of the stick in a lot of ways. Uh, finally, one last question I'm just really curious about, do you know how they actually solved the longitude problem? 
because that was really daunting and and based on the you know physical situation i can't imagine there's any way they could have gotten a timepiece you know to to stay running long enough to do it um do you know how they did the astronomical observations because it's a it's really an astonishing feat for its time so um, Okay, great. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, yes, and I believe, don't you have an essay in that volume as well? So I was- uh, I, I have one on the works, yes. And, and then <laughs> another article that's uh, supposed to be coming out in the journal Baltic Worlds as well, uh, describing the collection as a whole. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, you, I mean, on the, on the longitude, um, I need, I need to look into it more. There's um, the specific calculations based on, I mean, you can do it based on, I read a fair amount about it, but I don't feel like I'm on top of it yet, Nathaniel, honestly. Something, something about the moons of Jupiter. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yes, it's moons of Jupiter, you're exactly yeah. right. Um, yeah. Uh, so they were doing all these things. I didn't get as far as figuring out exactly what, but I'm, I'll put, it's on my list, okay? I'm getting lots of things on my list. Thank you guys, okay? <laughs> uh, well, now we have a question from Yagal Badagara. Uh, he says, you mentioned some Mongolian maps that have been used. Uh, can you give a little bit more detail on this? Was it Renat's maps or something else? Mongolian maps. Um, sorry, you got me again. I do not know specifically what they were. I mean, this again, this is from the 19th century source that tells us where, what maps they were using. I mean, the next step would be to go and try to find them and find what they were using. I'm really sorry, but I can't answer that one either. So Nikita uh, Balagurov, would you like to pose a question, Nikita? You had a comment. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you ask to unmute yourself? You should be unmuted now, but we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll read your comment. Uh, you said uh, responding to Christine Wang that it, it this her her. Um, her comments indeed were uh, related to Elena Vishlinkova's argument in her book, uh, which I think is an interesting context for this project in general. Um, if you want to uh, elaborate on that, um, you could just put it in the chat. And then um, Kelly O'Neill, Kelly, this is right up your alley. Uh, would you like to make a comment? You're talking about one of the a digitalized uh, 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 map. Kelly, are you there? I don't see her. So she's referenced a map in the chat that's in the Rumsey collection. Okay, Allison Smith, uh, a question. Uh, Allison, please unmute yourself. Or Sasha, unmute Allison. <laughs> There we go. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I have to admit that I've been, I also found a version of the um, Atlas on the Leninka site and it's quite a remarkable. That's, that's, where, that's where mine is from, Allison. It's from the Leninka. Yeah, I mean, it's so just- they started, They're now floating around I and mean, this is not, this is, uh, yeah, it's not the digitalized is- uh, yeah, that was just more for anybody else who happened to be looking, but I couldn't help but really notice how interesting a lot of the, I'm sure, Here's where my lack of knowledge of cartography goes. The sort of the, the titles that have figures or other things for the individual maps, uh, because they're really quite fascinatingly different um, in their detail. And I wonder if you might talk a little bit more about um, what you think is going on with some of them. I can't help but note in particular that there's only one for any of the spaces east of basically Kazan and it has nothing to, it's from, it's the one for um, Ufa province and it has half naked people on it that look like they belong in a colonial map of not the Russian empire, but a very different uh, colonial empire. And just sort of thinking through some of the ways that those different images are being used as part of the sort of description of space of the people who are in there in other ways. Wait, I didn't get why, uh, why only one east? I mean, there's, 
there's six Siberian maps and there's they, yeah they have maps but they don't have the figurative um they just have a title at the top they don't have one of these colorful oh. like you showed the thing um the one for the Volga that has the fish oh I see okay uh, no, but, the yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about why say S Siberia doesn't get people or things in those ways it's literally just maps and titles with none of that that it's got many other sorts of detail but not that kind of detail mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but people you mean in terms of the insets the the uh-huh mm -hmm. um i somehow it doesn't i can think about it it doesn't surprise me for some reason because mm -hmm. siberia i mean it's really uh I mean, consistently with my impression that it's about the, it's the difficulty of mapping the territory. I mean, getting Kamchatka on the map is already, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure that it, uh, the, the expedition takes 10 years, right? By the time they're there, it's, um, they've been at it for a long time. I'm not sure it yet has a lot of character that they can express in, in little pictures. I think it's, there. there's not much of, an, much of an impression in that sense. It's putting it, they're more concerned with putting it quote unquote accurately on the, on the page, but I'll keep thinking about that one. Thank you. Um, I, I want to uh, add to that question then. Uh, Catherine, but yeah, in the on the map as a whole, do we see people uh, represented uh, iconically at all, with the exception of those little cartouche um, pictures at the sides? In other words, it's not that just the indigenous people are left out, but there are no people really. There are no people. No, that goes back to the early question of, of yeah. um, Yanni was asking. Yeah. At the beginning. No, there are not people depicted. It's just those are just illustrations. Uh, so, uh, Kelly O'Neill, I think you're um, available now, right? Kelly, can you ask your question? Sasha, do you find Kelly? I don't see her. I think she's actually left the meeting. Oh, okay. It's a request to unmute, but that's okay. So, um, uh, next, I have Alex Say. Alex Say. Uh, Please unmute yourself. I see that you were greeting Catherine from Tobolsk. Great. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my, my, my question is, uh, I greet you from homeland of Semyon Remezov, from Tobolsk, Timon region from Russia. My question is, how do you see the connection between this Atlas and Remezov's maps? Um, are you thinking, let me ask a question back. Are you thinking in terms of um, uh, uh, borrowed techniques or something like what, what, what do you have behind the question? What, no. В чем по вашему влияние Ремезова? Влияние. Да, влияние, влияние. Влияние картографии Ремезова на этот атлас. И могло ли быть это влияние? Ну, мне кажется, что принцип почти противоположный. It's, it's practically an opposite principle. So, um, is, uh, so Ремезов's idea is, um, this is something that, that uh, Valerie Kivelson has written about a lot, and perhaps you have also, I don't know. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a local place centered, uh, it's very clear where the, where the focus is. It doesn't matter where is north, where is south. To me, it's a, almost an opposite principle of this map. To me, this, map, this atlas tries to be uh, tries to implement particular scientific principles, and that's more important than anything else. It's not as important to capture the spirit, capture the flavor of the rivers, the forests, as as Remesov does. In Remesov's maps, uh, Moscow is periphery, Tobolsk is center. <laughs> yes, Tobolsk is the center. Um, yeah, she explores this at length, you know, and the, it's also a religious, re religiously themed. Um, uh, so I think this map is practically trying to subvert it. I mean, it's almost the opposite of his. Mm -hmm. 
that's how I see it. Ramzov is not imperialism. <laughs> is not is not imperialist. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. It is a patri patriot of Siberia, uh -huh. maybe. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, maybe I will follow up on that question. Um, you mentioned in the earlier in the talk that there was a kind of an amalgam of um, so-called European, let's say, uh, scientific uh, tactics of advanced science of the time of cartography and these representational uh, figurings of the, the trees, for example, the little trees, the the step, the uh, way that the churches and factories are, are put on, the, are iconically put on the map. So um, could you say more about uh, that, those little images, don't they seem to come from a more Russian mapping tradition? Uh, and how did the team deal with this? Did they, did they argue about whether you should have little pictures of trees and, and their orientation, uh, or, or was this um, uh, really uh, accepted immediately by the so-called Europeans? Mm -hmm. um, yes, exactly, Jane. That was the point I was trying to get across, so I hope that that worked, that they were trying to conserve elements from the Na Russian indigenous tradition, and I think that Kirillov was responsible for a lot of it. I mean, if you look at he, uh, we just, Alexei was telling us about um, Remezov's maps. Kirillov's maps are much closer to Remezov's than yeah. these are. Um, he also, he has the, the forests and the rivers and um, it, it is very, very similar to the, the 17th century maps. Um, they, it was not smooth going. I don't know if they had specific arguments of how, how you would draw a tree or how you would draw a town or a flag, um, but but clearly, I mean, there were arguments and Kirillov did feel like he had to make his own maps in addition to this because he wanted to get it done. He didn't care as much about the absolute precision of measurements. So clearly there was controversy. Uh, Kelly, uh, you're back with us, right? Is Kelly O'Neill there? I Sasha, can you find Kelly? Yeah. Yep. I've just asked to unmute Kelly if you'd like to unmute yourself. There we go. I've, I've unmuted. Hello, I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please <laughs> go ahead with any questions you have, Kelly. Oh, uh, okay. So apologies though, because I did just have to step away because it was terribly loud in my household. So if I'm asking something that you've just explained, just you know, give me a virtual slap on the face and we'll move on. Um, but I was wondering about um, if you were able to do any digging into, I was kind of thinking about the question that you raised about the presence or lack of presence of the Muslim villages. Um, and it, the thought that immediately popped into my mind was that there was simply, there was an intention perhaps for the villages to be present in the Volga region as well as in Crimea, um, but that perhaps as they're moving from kind of large amounts of data into large scale maps, that this was something that simply dropped away, right, in the process of, of moving through scale um, as the maps are being designed. And I'm wondering if there were other um, evidences of kind of these kind of curious absences um, that you noticed um, that might've been part of simply the, the, the cartographic process, the design process, um, rather than the product of or in addition to being the product of kind of an ideological program or idea of empire um, that was baked into the map. Okay, thank you. I, I'm thrilled that someone responded to that question, which was what I was hoping to hear more um, ideas about. Um, actually, I, I can't, I can't, Kelly, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think it was a matter of scale because all they had to do was put, I mean, there are plenty of little towns with um, the churches are depicted in this region. For some reason, they just do, the the little crescents are simply not there in that entire region. So it has to have been a conscious decision of some kind. I don't think it's a cartographic problem. Um, I'd be more than open to suggestions about better ideas than than mine, but I don't think it's a cartographic problem. Kelly, is that okay? Are you muted again? Okay, never mind. I won't ask you then. Um, Nikita, 
Kalakurov, you, you have a comment as well here that is still is relating to this. You say that, of course, Vishlenkova's argument mm -hmm. was about the scientific uh, re uh, visualization of Russian empire and that it has to do with ambition to present Russia as an enlightened polity. Now, perhaps you want to elaborate on that and to see to what extent it's coherent with what um, Catherine is saying. Are you there, Nikita? Oh, yeah, we still can't hear you for some reason. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, do others have questions who um, have not managed to put them in the chat? Oh, it looks like I just received a private message from Elizaveta Reichlina. I can um, unmute you. Just one moment. I can see you, Elizabeth. Nice to see you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. So thank you for that presentation. That's really, it was uh, fascinating. Um, so I actually have three questions. Um, the first is, was this atlas ever presented to Empress Elizabeth? And I mean, do we know? Um, the second is, you stated in the beginning of your presentation that one of the goals in making this atlas was to integrate Russian cartography into a sort of European scientific cartography and to make the uh, Russian empire more legible and complete in a sort of global scientific understanding. So do we know if European academies of sciences uh, looked at this atlas, did they react in any way to it, do we know? Um, and my third question is, since you were uh, writing this pandemic paper using 19th century sources, did the 19th century sources provide any kind of commentary on the value of this atlas. Of course, this was this was already in a later context, but it, it would be interesting um, just to hear if they mentioned anything. Thanks. Um, interesting about presentation to the Empress, I don't know. Um, about integrating cartography and it being read by other academies of sciences, yes. Um, it was, in fact, um, presented and used. And the 19th century sources um, were very thrilled by this atlas. <laughs> There's a whole book by a person called Svenska, which studies it and um, puts it into context. And I got a lot of my information from him because that's what I had. But of course, they, for them, of course, it's... Um, it's the, the story of progress and of increasing scientific method and the capacity to, um, to create better and better and more perfect atlases. So to them, it's the first, it's the first scientific um, on an on a increasing scale. It's, it's the first um, real increasingly accurate portrayal of the empire. So mm -hmm. yes, they had a high opinion of it. Thank you. Well, I think I'll allow myself to uh, ask another question. <laughs> um, you mentioned Kirillov going off and, and um, uh, making his own atlas. So uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that project and how it relates to this one. This also gets back to Jeff's, Jeff Brooks's question about private and state sources of, of um, printing and funding and so on. So how did Kirillov carry this out? And what do we know about his atlas? Sure, I didn't want to inundate you with too many maps, but you can actually access it online very easily. Um, well, he's, a, he's, a, he's the, the state servitor. He's not an academy person. So he had as many connections as needed. Um, he obviously wasn't able to carry through the entire project, there's only uh, only um, 37, I think, of them were printed. So he was, he was only, I mean, the project was a lot bigger than he could, um, he could achieve. But um, the Atlas itself is on, uh, it's on Runiverse, you know, this site, which has so many wonderful things. And if you look there, um, you can see his version of the, it looks a lot more, um, as we were saying with Alexei, a lot more like um, Remesov's 
maps. He's his principle that he wanted to introduce into this the crafting of this atlas. And yes, they did have arguments about it. The principle was using the rivers primarily and also charting the trees and showing the because he he was impatient with this um, French obsession with um, the instruments and charting the precise locations. He wanted to get it down on paper as soon as as possible. So that's the sort of thing that they argued about. But you can see it and it's very pretty too. It's very nice looking, but it doesn't do this thing of, of um, inscribing the territory onto the map of the world. You, the only way you can do that is latitude and longitude. And, um, and that's, that's what this atlas does that none, no previous Russian atlas had done. Okay, well, Catherine, would you like to conclude with that or would you like to make a few more comments? Um, I don't know, maybe we should finish. I was, I was going to talk a little bit more about the, the north, the south, the way the Black Sea boundary was, was depicted, but I actually think we've gone through enough. So maybe I'll save that for some other occasion. I think we've had a lot to, to think about here already. Okay, well, thanks to everybody. We had over 100 participants, lots of questions, and it was a wonderful talk. So thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you so much for the helpful questions and lovely to, to see everyone. Okay, thank you so much. It was really, really helpful. Thank you.